Let's just get started by saying hello, everybody, and welcome to this Unlimited Mind, episode number five in a fantastical series we've had about people who are unlimited in terms of their consciousness and are doing things to help other people become more. So I have no doubt that what Lauren shares with us today is going to strike a resonant chord within you. And so now let me just say, welcome, Lauren, and thank you so much for being here. Dr. Lauren Belg, probably everybody has read a little bit about you, but I'll just start out by saying that you are a critical care physician and a committed collector of hospital patients' near-death experiences. You wrote an award-winning book, Near Death in the ICU, Stories from Patients Near Death and Why We Should Listen to Them. And if you want to just hold that book up, Lauren, Donna, <laughs> and I can guarantee you, having read it and underlined quite a lot in it, it's a fascinating book, beautifully written, and it gives us hope that there is another side, and there are parallel experiences of it. They are convincing among people who have clinically died, and people come back to tell about it. And that's what Lauren shared in her book. She has also published essays in Mysterious Ways, Pulse, and the Anthology Our Children Live On. Lauren's also working on a second edition of Near Death in the ICU to include stories, people's stories of near death experiences during the pandemic, uh, reaching back over the last three, four years. I first encountered Lauren at the Monroe Institute, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later on when we share the brainwave patterns that I recorded while we, she did a self-guided meditation. But this is also a good place to say that she, after her the publication of her book, was invited to co-facilitate a residential program at the world-renowned Monroe Institute called NDE Spectrum, where participants can experience and embody through guided meditations, the transformative benefits of the NDE without physically dying, which is what everyone wants. <laughs> and in fact, this is probably a good place to say that this work exists today, Awakened Mind Training and the Mind Mirror, because Anna Wise, who was my teacher and a student of C. Maxwell Cade, who invented the Mind Mirror, had four near death experiences. And in one of them, she climbed the steps and heard the singing of the celestial choirs, just went into the tunnel, the whole thing. And she later on, years later, not knowing what to do with that, somebody pulled her out of the water where she was drowning and she cursed them and went, damn you, <laughs> because she was in such a phenomenal space. She subsequently met Max Cade in London, and that was her goal, to find out how to have these experiences of the other dimension or dimensions without having to die. So what you are offering is something I have no doubt we are all tremendously interested in. So why don't we just start out with asking you to just share a little bit about your own background and how you ended up having experiences that in a way prepared you for what you ultimately encountered in the ICU. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Judith, first of all, for having me on your show. I really appreciate that. Just to be clear, I am a physician and a practicing physician. I'm not an NDE researcher. The re reprovable aspects of an NDE are really not that important to me. What is really captures my interest is how these anomalous events affect lives. And that's where I became interested in recording them when I had patients tell me things that they witnessed about things going on around them in the ICU without dying, which I would probably term an out-of-body experiences, and then experiences people shared with me spontaneously and my team, not just me, but things people felt compelled to share after clinical death. And that really intrigued me because as a science person, I couldn't really fit that into the scaffolding that I knew. 
But it was clear to me that these experiences had profound experience and impact on people's lives, on the patients that I cared for. So I became curious in wanting to know what they experienced, what it meant to them, and how that translated into having a positive effect on you know, their forward progression as a human being. That's what really compelled me to explore this further and to write this book. And tell us a little bit about your background growing up. You came from uh, a family that was not very open to these kinds of ideas, to say the least. How sure. did you happen to open up to them? I, so I grew up in a very rather rigid background. My, my father was a, a pastor, a Southern Baptist pastor. So they were very, very constrained views of what the world beyond consisted of and how we lived within this current world to to acquire that. And that, for reasons I cannot explain, that never really sat well with me. Even as a young kid, I was, my, my instincts told me that existence was broader. And I can't really explain why I came into the world with that view, but I always felt this pressure to move beyond what people were telling me was true to discover my own truth. And that was a compulsion I came into this world with and still drives my curiosity today. I consider it a gift, really, to have felt compelled from the beginning to push against the constraints of rigid belief systems to explore what was true for me. And I still hold on to that, that, that tenet that we all have the right to explore what is true for us. And even within the realms of an NDE experience or an out-of-body experience, our own experience of it is the truth of that moment. And what we extract from that experience is what informs us on our own journey. And I, I did learn growing up, though, that it is a, a human habit to try to take these extraneous experiences that really are not physically defined and put them into a mold that makes sense and things we don't understand that it's not comfortable for us. And I, I certainly understand that, uh, but to be able to hold it lightly and extract from it our own personal meaning, it has become what is so important to me. And I certainly encourage that whenever I'm talking to patients about their anomalous experiences is the first question I ask is, what do you think that meant? What does it mean to you? And to try to religiousize those experiences and dogmatize those experiences is so limiting. But at the same time, we want to try to categorize them and to try to, in, in order to understand them, to be able to hold it lightly, allowing our own interpretation is, I think, what's called for in these experiences that we cannot. And that is as opposed to what you found is the typical response in the medical community. Maybe not as much now as it was when you first started out, but you found that they were not really receptive and tended to ignore, deny, and try to talk people out of their experiences, right? Yeah, and I, I think they're well-meaning. I don't think that, I, I think of a particular sentinel event that prompted me to write this book when I felt like I had something to contribute to the conversation as a medical professional is one of my colleagues that I've known for years. He and I happened to be seeing this post-operative patient and the, this person saw the surgeon and was excited to, to share this experience saying, I saw you work on me. I saw you in the operating room. And, and she described this event from up above a perspective that was above and out of her body looking down. And she described in great detail what the operating suite looked like, what they were doing to her. And my colleague said, and I think he was very well-meaning, said, well, you have to understand the brain is can do funny things when it's under anesthesia and when you're very sick. And my instinct was to say, do not stomp on her truth, her experience. And fortunately, this is a colleague that I had a really good rapport with, and we all laughed about it. And he was able to reframe and say, tell me what you experienced. But that was really a, a central event that prompted me to listening to anomalous patient experiences is part of good patient care. It, we don't have to understand it. We don't even have to believe in it. We're talking about something that the patients, and I say patients because that's my world, 
we're, we're talking about an experience patients cannot prove to us did happen. We cannot prove to them it didn't happen. Then what is that middle ground where we are able to excavate the importance of that event for the patients we're caring for? That's what became so important to me and still and remains so. So I suppose that you're working under enormous amounts of stress in the ICU. Who, who are the patients there and why are they so likely to have out-of-body and near-death experiences? I think that's one reason I love the ICU so much is that I am on a daily basis working at the cutting edge of human peril. I work in two different ICUs across two campuses. One is predominantly trauma-based. And, and you would think instinctively that would carry an inherent vulnerability to have out-of-body and near-death experiences. At, at that particular campus where we have trauma and neuro ICU, I do hear a lot of experiences, but then the other campus is more cardiac based and general surgical. So it, there certainly is some overlap. And then during COVID, that kind of blew my mind as to far as the types of experiences that I was able to bear witness to. Tell us about some of these experiences. I know that some of them are quite stunning in their scope and have proved themselves to be true over time, especially. Some of them are OBEs. Some of them are full-blown NDEs. Just mm -hmm. tell us about some of the ones that struck you the most and most impressed you. I think just stepping back and looking at over the past 25 years, the types of experiences I've encountered, what has become clear to me is that it really is a spectrum. That it, as much as we would like to compartmentalize what an NDE is and what an OBE is, there, there is quite a wide spectrum of experiences. I'm, I'm reminded recently of just three weeks ago, whenever I was working at the campus that is primarily cardiac in nature, I, a patient started telling me spontaneously about an experience that she had years before when she was so sick. And ironically, I had, according to the medical records, I had taken care of her during oh. this period. And it, there was nothing really that triggered me to inquire at that time, about six years prior to her telling me six weeks, uh, three weeks ago. But she said that she had been incredibly ill, not necessarily by our standards near death, but certainly sick enough that would take her to the very edge with the possibility of dying. And in reviewing the medical records, I saw that there were several moments where she, her situation was very tenuous. But now, fast forward six years later, where she's telling me this most recently, is that she had a range of experiences where when she was most ill, she would separate from her body and observe what we were doing to her from within the physical confines of her ICU room, which I suppose now I would consider that an out-of-body experience as opposed to NDE, where it's still physically bound, although I, I try to hold those definitions lightly. But then she also explained where she had this moment where she was, in her words, sucked out of the room to a space that was like a void that was dark, but silky and comforting and loving, where she encountered her brother who had preceded her in death, who said, it's not your time to die. And when she was sharing this with me three weeks ago, her mother was in the room as well as her son. And she said that at that time, she was informed that she would become a grandmother and that her son in two years would have a child, which he was able to tell me now that's exactly what happened. And she knew the child's name without even telling, without her son telling her. So that it sounds fantastical. And I can understand to a, a, a skeptical mind that might seem beyond belief. But it was her truth. This is what she shared with me. And I, there is zero way that I can prove that what she experienced was real. But what I can say is it was real to her. And it was real to the people in the room that she was related to and that she loved. And it elevated 
the, you know, the three people that was in, that were in the room while she was sharing this, herself, her mother, and her son, it elevated their own perception of what was possible. And we will never be able to prove it. And I think it fundamentally doesn't matter because it impacted them in a positive way. Yeah. So how would you define the difference between an OBE and an NDE? Understanding that we, this is an inexact science and we are entertaining subjective experiences and trying to make sense of them in our bumbling human way. What I've observed among the patients who share their experiences with me is an out-of-body experience is more confined to the physical environment so that you're able to in some way extract yourself or be extracted outside of your physical body and have a slight expansion of a perceptual sense of being able to see what's going on from from a, a view that's above you or beside you, your physical being. I think a near-death experience, and again, I do believe this is a spectrum of experiences, but near-death experiences tend to go beyond that. And patients report to me they have an experience of touching something that's beyond our physical world, where they are able to be one with all, so that unity consciousness, or connect with people that have crossed over, or to know things that are not possible, like the birth of a, a child that hasn't yet happened. And I, I think anything in between that spectrum is possible to experience, that whether it's an Al OBE or an NDE or a dream, a lucid dream, any way that we receive information that is beyond our five physical senses, I think is fair game for this spectrum of OBE to NDE experience. I wonder what kind of effect encountering these people who are speaking of this dimensions beyond beings who appear to them, sensations that, sensations of indescribable love. How has that affected you? Oh, immensely. I think I had a conversation with a, a nurse last week who said it's, it's impossible to work in the ICU all these years and not think about reality differently, isn't it? And I'm like, yes, that's exactly <laughs> right. You, the, if you, I, I think we all have, whether we're in the ICU or, or not, no matter our environment, we have the, there's an inherent invitation to, to see things differently and to perceive things beyond our five physical senses. Um, I think sometimes people who are working in more emergent situations may have that veneer peeled back a little more readily, but I think we all have access to that information of being able to see that we're more. So that absolutely, Judith, being in this environment has impacted me tremendously. I wonder if as an illustration of what you've just said, you would tell us about the story of Marlene, a Native American woman uh, with an amniotic fluid embolism. That struck me as the single most astonishing story in your book. Yeah, so that that is that's pretty remarkable. So, so Marlene, that is not her real name, but she is a nurse who is now retired. But at the time that I gathered that story and had permission to share it. She had an amniotic fluid embolism, which is, it carries a high risk of death. And it's hard to resuscitate somebody from that moment. But she had this experience of both what I would consider an OBE, of rising through a physical building and being able to see things outside of the building, including the texture of the roof, what was going on with a delivery truck outside of the hospital. And then beyond that, to experience something otherworldly in the context, I might add, of her belief system. She has a strong uh, Native American structure that she is having that holds this human experience for her. And so she had the experience of seeing elders and, and, and knowing something about a child that would come into her life later on that had some disabilities, knowing what the name of the child was and that actually came to pass. So that's... I, I love the language you use there. If I can uh, paraphrase it. Sure. She said that after she went up through the roof, the hospital to the roof, 
in hypersensory detail and saw and could later report all of that, that she moved toward an elongated cloud-like substance very fast, then over water, and that she was able to sink herself wherever she wanted to go. So this could be an OBE, but then it crosses over into, I think, what you were defining as an NDE. When you wrote, then a field of golden grain, and that took her to a vast silent void where she saw deceased relatives who she wept and embraced them. Uh, and then she saw Native American elders with a child, and they said, this one is special, and she will need you. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, that I feel emotional just hearing that again. And, and so was she when she was telling me. And not to, just to step away a moment from that, I think what I was not able to create very well is when she was moving through that field of wheat, she talked about how she could hear the shucking like the husks of wheat, how it was so hyper real to her. And my curiosity about that moment is being able to be in that physical environment. Did that set her up to trust her experience of mm -hmm. something that was not so tangible? Mm -hmm. And to, she said when she came back into her body that she believed absolutely what she had experienced, that she believed absolutely that she would that she had a purpose in coming back. And it was not for the people who are immediately around her right now, but it was for that child who, who was, hadn't been born yet. Not even been born yet. Yeah. And this turned out to be her grandchild, grandchild. Crystal. And mm -hmm. they told her the name of the child. And this mm -hmm. was why you can't go back because this is what you, this is your mission. This is what you have to do on the earth is to take care of, help take care of this child. And then some years later, the child, 11, so she was born autistic, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, of course, her daughter had a lot of trouble taking care of the child. And so Marlene uh, stepped up and helped with that. And, and the child would basically say that. Yeah. And she couldn't say much else than that, except that one day she turned to her grandmother and said, I saw you before, Granny, yeah. when you yeah. came to heaven. Oh. No. <laughs> I still feel so emotional when I hear that. That's how we feel when we hear those experiences. Imagine the people who are actually experiencing them. So and I, true. And I think some of your, your viewers who are on now had experiences where they came back and saw everything differently experienced everything differently after a, a near-death experience. Do you want to uh, talk to people about that? We have well, quite a few people with us today. Feel free to interview whoever. I think one name that comes to mind is Donna Rapido. I, I've had the, the privilege of hearing her experience, and I think it, it there, there are so many variations in near-death experiences that not necessarily, they don't necessarily have technicolor. They don't necessarily have visuals. Sometimes it's just a feeling. But I think a common thread is people come back changed. They have a different view about what's important and their purpose in life. And I think I have heard Donna share her story and it's, it's pretty tremendous. I'll try to give the Cliff Notes version. <laughs> I drowned and in the process of, so I was in a lake and a tow rope strangled my leg to the bone and I was dragged underwater and drowned. And I wasn't expecting to die. And I came out of my consciousness, left my body. And the first thing I realized that there was no time there. And I came back now knowing the difference between time and eternity. And I didn't go through a tunnel. But it, I don't want to say too much. I don't want to. This is your time, Lauren, but I appreciate you calling on me. Saw God in the form of uh, electricity, in the form of the closest thing I can say is an aurora borealis. And the telepathy was, you. The, I've had OBEs and there is a difference between OBE and NDE. Near death usually is has a uh, tragedy with it. So the rope strangled my leg. Uh, I have a very nice scar on my leg. I can't move it as well. 
But when I encountered God, he gave me a, a choice. But the love was so tremendous, I did not want to go back. It, it, there, there, it's a love beyond, like Lauren said, it's, you can't even, it's the love here, say your greatest love here on earth. Think about that for a minute. Who have you loved the most? Where did you get the most love? It's 10 times, 100 times better when you're in the presence of the creator of the universe. And so the creator is not a, I didn't see a gender, not a he or she. The telepathy was instant communication. We, I, he was, I'm going to say he was telling me, I said everything. And he's, is he saying, I know everything at the same time. I even know the number of the grains of sand on a beach in New Zealand. And as soon as that was said, I was immediately rocketed down to a, that beach Knew that I also knew the number of grains of sand rocketed back up. He gave me a choice. What do you want to do here? And I'm, it just was, it shocked me that I said, since you made me, I give the choice to you. And then I had to wait because I gave my choice to him. And I waited and waited. I don't know if it was three seconds or three million years. It felt like forever. And then I heard, when you go back, you're going to explain choice and surrender. So I have a YouTube channel where I've done a whole PowerPoint on what choice is. But is that what you wanted to know, Lauren? Is there part of my NDE uh, that well, I you think, wanted? To... Yeah, thank you, Don. I think a couple of things from your experience that I think is worth highlighting is she didn't experience a tunnel. You know, and I think we limit ourselves when we are trying to understand our own anomalous experiences by trying to fit them into definitions that we've heard instead of just stepping aside and inviting curiosity into what that experience means for us and what it has to teach us. I think there's another thing is that mine's a little bit different than others is I didn't see what I would believe. My belief system didn't come with me. I didn't, what I saw, I didn't expect. What I heard, I didn't expect. What I felt, yeah. all of, everything that I experienced was nothing I expected. Which and, I, I think is lovely, actually. Yeah. If you could hold that experience in curious regard instead of dismissing it and say that didn't fit in the descriptions I've heard or the, the recipe for what a, a traditional NDE should be, if you can hold that mysterious moment in you hold it lightly and invite um, information to come to you about what it meant to you. I think that's the power of it. And I think an interesting thing, too, about Donna's experience that I see over and over again is belief systems become, it is a lens through which we can interpret what happens to us. But at some point, it really falls apart and, and it fails us in our ability to describe an anomalous experience. I, I have, I carry with me an, an intense curiosity about belief systems and its overlay in, into our anomalous experiences. Um, hearing people in my community who have NDEs express they saw Christ or they saw angels and they will describe beings that people in my community who are also Native Americans will say those were elders. And people who are from our Laotian community will say those were ancestors. They, they describe similar beings, but through a lens of an earthbound belief system. And I, yeah, I, I think that's okay. It, it, we organize our experiences into the scaffolding of a belief system to hold our experiences so that we can learn from them and extract meaning from them. Mm -hmm. It's when we close the door to, to being able to perceive it in any other way that that ability to extract valuable insight becomes a little restricted. And so I understanding that we have belief systems and that they serve us. Otherwise, I think it might be, I don't know, a little too frightening or a little too difficult to navigate. Belief systems are there to serve us, not to hinder us. And whenever they hold us back from, from extracting an experience for its greatest truth, I think that is a liability. Whenever it enhances our ability to extract cru truth for our greatest good, then the belief systems are an asset. I wonder if people can even have uh, an NDE if they don't believe it's possible. In fact, I tell you, many years ago, I had a, basically a mystical experience 
that sounded exactly like what Kenneth Ring was writing about and heading toward Omega. And I wrote him a letter, and to my utter astonishment, he wrote back six weeks later and said, Boy, you really put this exactly right. And it sounds like, yeah, that it was the same kind of experience. And he sent me a few published papers of his. And one of them I found particularly interesting because he had conducted a study showing that by far the majority of people who have NDEs or people who have had some sort of emotional or could be physical trauma in life that somewhat dissociated them from ordinary five sensory concrete perceptions of reality. So there was something in them that was open to the possibility of there being more to begin with. And I wonder, have you had many people, and I'd love to go back to Donna for a second because you asked her and we didn't hear her answer. How did that change her life? Donna, were you as open-minded before or did something change in you? I had never heard of a near-death experience before my own, but I feel like it changed everything in my life, changed everything. As I saw things there that I wasn't taught, that I, like Lauren said, I had no scaffolding, if you will. And so when I, it, it, it happened rapidly. So before I knew it, I went through this veil and I said, oh, there's no time here. And then the next thing was, oh, I'm dead. And then the next thing was, I wonder where they're going to have the funeral. And then I could, even though I had no body, I then began having experiences around my senses, which I thought was odd because I didn't have a body. I didn't have eyes, but I saw, I didn't have ears, but I heard. I wasn't speaking. It was all telepathy. And since I came back, I don't think people, there's something about near death that people don't talk about, and that's post-traumatic stress syndrome, post-traumatic stress. And it's not just the PTSD of the event. I, I was, I was, my leg was strangled to the bone. I thought it was amputated, but it was strangled. But it was the post-traumatic stress of seeing God and, and coming back here and, and having that, seeing this, uh, this amazing experience and coming back and then having that close, I've not, I've gone back through meditation and I've gone back through other ways, but it will never be the same as that original experience. And so there's a grief in that and there's a, your belief system fell away and there's a grief in that. I no longer had the same belief system that I had that was holding me up or whatever. So it became, I, I can feel time on my skin. How do you explain that? I have greater clairvoyance. I'm a remote viewer. I never had those kinds of things. So the gifts we come back with, a lot of people go, boy, I wish I had an NDE. And then I show them my leg. If you talk to NDE years that had a physical component, they're usually scarred up. They were car crashes or if they had open heart surgeries or whatever. And people also think that because we've seen God, that our life back here should be rainbows and butterflies and unicorns. But we, when we come back, I even had someone ask me to, he asked a question on behalf of God. What does God think about this? And I said, I'm sorry, I don't have his job description. I don't, I can guess what I think, what he might do. But there's a lot of misconceptions around the near-death experience. OBE, you can go OBE overnight. When you wake up, you usually are scarred. You know, usually don't have, usually can wake up the next day. You're not in the hospital. But like Lauren, Lauren said, it's like, if you talk to 100 near-death experiencers, you're going to get 100 different near-death experiences. And that's because I call it a designer death. I, I knew when I met with God that there was a moment there where I felt there was no one else in the universe. It was me and God, that he created the entire universe just for me to make me happy. He also, I realized how much he loved my sense of humor. We, had, we joked together, and some people hate that I joked with God. I said, he's really white. It's most, he, the love that he has, he calls us by our names. He loves us beyond a love. So when you've had that experience and you come back here, it's very heavy. It feels dark. It feels, it's hard. And this has been, been 25 years this year. I've been back 25 years away from that. And so it's tough at times, but. You, you come back with a lot. You come back with a lot. Lauren, something 
you were saying put this uh, analogy in my mind of this the other side, other dimensions being like this. And to be in this earth plane that we narrow down into this little funnel. <laughs> and that through meditation, okay, through out of body, through prayer, through whatever, we have, we might widen that funnel a little bit. But that there, I can see how that would be something you would grieve over <laughs> once you've had this, <laughs> to have to go back down to this, where you don't even have words that can describe the enormity of what you felt. And but still, some part of you is linked in to the totality of it all because you've come back uh, with uh, these abilities. And I know, Lauren, in your book, you said that not everyone does, but some people do. One guy came back and he could see auras, and he didn't have need eyeglasses or his hearing aid anymore. As time passed, he ultimately did, but he <laughs> saw with perfection heard like never before and maybe he still sees uh the spirit body the auric field um but but did you find this to be a commonality with people that they their sensitivity would be heightened in some way there's there's a lot to to unpack in the the past minutes of, of conversation um and I'm, I'm just trying to keep track of it but one thing i want to go back and revisit is um the uh, an effort, uh, Judith, when you started a few minutes ago, of researchers to say these are the conditions that leave people open to having near-death experiences, and then understand taking that over to what Donna said about what is likely to cause you some post-traumatic stress or anxiety around the experience. I think we have to be very careful about being rigid as far as the what what could invite you know that experience because I've had patients who never saw it coming, didn't have any anything that would necessarily leave them vulnerable by to a near death experience in ways that researchers have tried to untangle. But I also have had patients who have experienced the stress and anxiety around the experience after it's happened. Um, and people who have not, people who have had extrasensory perception that stuck, some that happened and then faded, and some people who didn't have it at all. So I think we have to, just as we have a wide array of human experiences in this existence, there's a wide swath of non-human experiences in this anomalous zone. And just, I, I think of in terms of people who have ecstatic religious experiences and people who don't, yet their belief still means so much to them on, on both ends, ends of those spectrums. People who go to sleep and don't dream at all versus people who have award-winning technicolor dreams. We all have, you know, there's that spectrum of experiences. And I think as far as the post-traumatic stress that I'd like to, to talk about, I, I think it, any experience that you have, whether it's a joyful experience or a troubling experience or a traumatic experience, has that potential to cause some anxiety because it's outside of our everyday, normal, anticipated experience. And when you have something that is outside of the anticipated experience that you can't neatly put back into an organized way that helps you carry on, it, ca it can resurface and cause anxiety. And I think I've talked about this a lot with my husband, who is a clinical psychologist and worked in as a health psychologist and helping people with post-traumatic stress situations around illness. And his take on it has been very helpful in interacting with patients, uh, with me interacting with patients who've had near-death experiences and out-of-body experiences is, first of all, providing as the listener a normalizing supportive environment, like you're not crazy, something happened to you, I believe you, tell me more. And that is the first step to being able to integrate an experience is honoring the truth of it for the person who experienced it. We don't categorize it. We don't define it. We don't say, oh, what you experienced clearly was this, or what you experienced clearly was not this. We don't know. So the first step in helping people integrate an experience, which is, I, I think that in that journey of 
experience to integrating it, you can come through some anxiety. You can come through some post-traumatic stress and being able to arrive on the other side of it and integrate it into a helpful and, and useful way for, the, the re- for this life and beyond is being able to have someone listen in a caring and understanding way to be able to find other people who had a similar experience mm-hmm. and now they're not alone in it, I think is important. And to be able to walk that journey with someone who is curious along with you about how that experience, the what you remember from that post-traumatic experience, ex, that near-death experience, the out-of-body experience, how it impacts your life now, I think at the core of it is having it validated and being able to revisit the anxiety-provoking moments in a supportive environment. I think I, I realize this is a, a run-on explanation, but I think there's a lot to be said about the post-traumatic experience of any kind is being able to, beyond hearing people have shared experiences, being able to talk with others in support groups who have had a similar experience, if it continues to be disruptive to you, being able to revisit those moments that you find most anxiety-provoking about that experience with someone who is trained in trauma therapy is important. And it doesn't matter if you were, had a physical experience that caused you trauma or a non-physical experience that caused you trauma. The residue is similar if it's disrupted to you and causes you anxiety, causes you sleepless nights. And there, there are people who are actually trained to walk you through that moment and untangle those feelings and to help you reorganize it in a more cohesive way that can help you lead a successful life. Do you find that most people are traumatized by these experiences or do they, or they at least equally, if not more spiritually awakened and encouraged and uh, potentially even just overjoyed and have that carry into their lives? But I think it runs the gamut. I I think the areas where the, the patients I've encountered where it's traumatizing to them is that the people around them don't believe them. Ah, okay. That, um, and, and that, again, I'm just speaking to my personal experience, but yeah. you know, patients that I've interviewed who have found it troubling, the people around them who are most important to them, the people who validate, the people we look to validate our experiences, mm-hmm. if it wasn't validated, then that's traumatizing. Having, having someone hold that experience with acceptance can take you a long way down the road to integrating that in in a positive way. But sometimes we have had patients in our ICU wake up and be excited and they didn't care what we thought or didn't think. They just wanted to tell everybody, listen to what happened to me. I think it's a spectrum. And I have to think that personalities have some impact on that too. Like everything we brought before us as part of our human experience to that moment impacts what we get out of it and impacts how we perceive it. I think it's true of even physical life experiences. What we get out of it is impacted by what we brought to it. So true. So true. You guys, I didn't mean to sound like it was just all post-traumatic stress. The joy that I've had since I've been back, my healing work that I've done, I know it's not for me. I get where it's coming from. And so the amount of people that have asked for uh, help and healing might tell them I, I'm a really good person I'm a good asker so I go over to the other side during my meditation and I just ask everybody that I met I go here's a name here's what they are here's the condition they would like it's not like a Christmas present but I know that people are working out things but just to be able to do that to connect like Lauren said you know, or I think Judith you said it it's the veil is open for me mm-hmm. so even though I'm not seeing necessarily the creator of the universe but he's got a lot of friends a lot of pals and so i've been able to do take reiki classes in fact two other people that are here took the class with me Um, so uh, the monroe institute it's been quite a journey to hear your guides say i'd like you to start a podcast oh really okay i want you to do a youtube channel oh okay i'm not doing anything else okay all right but to know, to have that, to have that knowledge that people seek, the people that are, I've been a chaplain in a hospital since I came back, and there are people that want to know, 
what am I going to see? What am I going to feel? And I start saying before, it's a designer death. God loves you so much or the creator of the universe loves you so much. He's going to have you have that experience. Maybe even if it's not on your belief systems, like Lauren said, that wasn't my belief system, but what you need and the, the joy. I, I had one of the experiences was extremely joyful. So I don't want that to get lost in me saying there's, there was some post-traumatic stress. I just, there's just aspects of that haven't been touched yet on the, 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 the trauma of seeing God. The trauma of seeing God. How can you have trauma seeing God? The trauma is not seeing him. It's, it's just stuff like that. And uh, if I get, but I put in a presentation for the IONS conference, and I plan on bringing my Native American flute. The reason I'm doing that is because there's no words to express. So I'm going to play my flute to express what I saw on the other side, because there are no words. There's but, just... I, yeah, I think it's really well said, Donna. An experience so profound is all of the things with all the ingredients and all the sauce. It's, it's all the things. And you can be excited about it, changed by it, traumatized by it, frightened by it, elated by it. Um, I think it's just like in any in, in a human experience that we say, oh my gosh, that's so exciting. And then we retract and say, oh my gosh, what's going to happen next? That's terrifying. I think it's, we bring our ability to process all that information to a near-death experience or an out-of-body experience as, as well. So it can be anxiety provoking and elating and exciting and transformative, all the things. That sounds like eerily like a description of life on this planet. 100%. Yeah. <laughs> but I like that during NDEs, people see or perceive things that they don't perceive on this planet, like Diane, who was in an auto accident and got trapped in her car, and two large amorphous beings approached her seven to eight feet tall, intensely bright, and they assured her that she would be okay. And she woke up hyperintuitive once they managed to get her out of the car, and then told her that she was going to have a heart attack. And two weeks later, she did have a heart attack, and But she knew it was coming to the minute. She went, oh, this is the heart attack that's going to come. And she went out of body and connected with another, this time a single presence that said, you're not going to die. Uh, and each time she floated out of her body or to an NDE, there were beings there. A lot of people describe those beings at or as orbs. And you yourself, Lauren, had an experience of orbs. Can you tell us about that? I did. Yeah. So I was, I'm, my husband and I have been married now for 23 years. He is my second husband. And my first husband, I went through a divorce when I was in medical school, which is not so unheard of in medical school. It's a very difficult road. And it just so happened to be around a time that I was experiencing a lot, having to prove myself intellectually, having to take exams. And it was just, it was a little too much. And then to have a divorce on top of that was devastating. I think we all have experiences, whether it's a divorce or loss of something or having the rug pulled out from under us that can leave us just totally adrift and with no energy. And that's where I found myself. Just, I was able to muster the energy to pull myself out of bed and go into my clinical rotations, do what I had to do. But then I, when I came home, I was, I was spent with no change left over. I was just, it was a dark time. And I, all I could do was go to bed. And I had the experience of waking up after going to bed and it was, there was bright light in the room, but just contained to the corner of the room where the ceiling meets the wall. And there, it, it was, there shouldn't have been an external source of light. So I but I was curious because there was a larger bluish orb and a smaller bluish orb. And I got up and explored all the sources of light that potentially could be shining into my room and there was nothing. And so I was just transfixed watching this and watched the slowly, very slowly, these lights, these orbs change position and just lost myself in them in a meditative moment. I think you, you and I, Judith, had the experience where you said, go to the deepest place you've ever been. And we're going to, we're going to look at her orb brain waves. <laughs> but that was a moment where I just thought I have no way to explain what this is. 
but it was, I was transfixed by it. And I, so I just sank into it and just felt unconditional love and just the deepest peace and went to sleep and just fell into this profound sense of sleep and woke up and felt different. Everything was different. How I felt was different. How I moved through the day was different. And I can't even explain it. I didn't have, I would consider that in the spectrum of OBEs or NDEs, even though I didn't leave my body, it was a spiritually transformative event that was. And this was, and you are taking your medical exams. I was getting ready to do that. Yes. Yes. So the fact that you were bottoming out before these orbs appeared, that was uh, extraordinary in itself. You were at this incredible low point feeling. I was at a very low point. Depressed and exhausted and unable to rise uh, to take those exams when you've been studying for literally years and working and, half to death to do it. So and I wouldn't say I was, I wouldn't say I was suicidal. That, that does that is not accurate, but it was one of those moments where I'm so exhausted and so profoundly depleted that it would be, be okay if I wasn't alive. I think we've all felt that kind of, many of us have felt that kind of exhaustion and depletion before. And it's, it's not a suicidal thought. I didn't have that, but it was just like, this is requiring so much energy that I just do not have. And that is a pivotal moment in my life. And in any ex- the experiences that I've had in seeking answers have been so incredibly subtle. They have not been technicolored events. And I think most of us who have these anomalous experiences, uh, very few, the percentage of people who have near death and OBE experiences by a traditional human definition are, are very small. And if we hold some space and broaden that, that definition of anomalous experiences to, to hold space for dreams and noticing things with our five senses that we can slowly expand, I, I think I have come to quite an prefer the term spiritual transformative experience over OBE or NDE, because I think you can have an uh, NDE and an OBE and not be changed by it. If it's something, even if it's just an insight, a thought that comes to you that causes you to pivot in how you regard something, another human encounter that just really changes your mind and your perception about something such that it is a spiritual transformative event, I think that's a valid and perhaps even more important place on the spectrum of spiritually transformative experiences. Absolutely. So maybe this is a good place for me to show the kind of consciousness in which Lauren experienced orbs. Of course, it may not be as quite as profound as it was for her to re- revisiting may not be as profound as it was originally, but <laughs> uh, it sure looked good here. So let me just go through. It's only a few slides, and then we're going to look at some kind of live brain waves. Okay. Let's see. Now that I knocked out the meeting controls. Okay, so that's why you can't knock out the meeting controls. All right, beg your pardon. Okay, now do I have them? Yes, here they are. All right, so I met Lauren in August of 2022 at the Monroe Institute, where uh, she and Candace Sanderson, who was on a previous program here, And Dr. Brian Daly, who we hope to have in the future, had all been asked by Monroe to be interviewed for a film that two filmmakers were creating. I'm wanting to say it's called The Consciousness Connection or something like that. But in any case, because they were there, they said, would you like to do brainwave sessions? And then they can interview you, Judith, about what with brainwaves as a representation of consciousness. Lauren and I were in the uh, research rooms. It's a control room uh, at Monroe, which has uh, almost no 
electrical or sound wave noise, and uh, it's such a beautiful situation for the mind mirror. Um, you know, I didn't really know anything much about Lauren except that she was an ICU physician and had written a book. And so I was flying by the seat of my pants and said, okay, then let's just do some different segments where you place a marker so that you have a particular segment in between two markers and can look at the data there. So we did eyes open, then eyes closed. And then I said, on a whim, just imagine that you're in the ICU and working in the ICU. I don't know if Lauren came up or I came up with the idea of her imagining herself doing a reball, which is a resonant energy balloon and something else. And basically, you're just expanding your energy field outward in all directions that you can perceive. And then I don't, I guess we must have talked to some extent so that I knew about her, the experience she just told you about with the orbs. So I did a segment on orbs. And then t toward the segment with the orbs, she started to merge with them. So I split that uh, in the recording into two different segments. And then she went into her highest state of pure consciousness. And so this is a composite display that I took in Ballistus. We're going to go to the portal to look at her brain waves and play from moment to moment. But so here's eyes open, eyes closed, the same one. Here she is in the IB, ICU doing the reball. Then we just let the orbs last for a really long time. Um, but I concluded this window to show you that when she started to merge with the orbs, look at her gamma down here. Her gamma amplitudes increased significantly. What we know, according to what people say, uh, as for their inner experience of gamma, is that anything over half a microvolt of gamma is subjectively noticeable. And sure enough, here she is exactly a half a microvolt, even a little bit more here at the end of merging with orbs and then is moving into this highest state of pure consciousness. So then here inside the Ballistus Mind Mirror, I broke these down in between the markers into these segments. And here's eyes open. You can see that she has some gamma. She was just asked to sit there for a short while. She's got eyes open alpha here in a, in a classic peak frequency, frequency bar for alpha, a lot of theta and a lot of delta. Then if she closes her eyes, her alpha increases let me see, 7.2, just very slight increase in her alpha, and her gamma quiets down a pretty good bit. And then when she goes to imaging ICU, I should have just put these all on the same microvoltage. I have 10 and 9, and then I started keeping it at 9 so you could see amplitude differences. But if I had made this 9 instead of 10, what you would see is pretty much exactly the same pattern. And in fact, you can look at the statistical values. These are all 100 hertz pattern statistics because she has so much high frequency gamma. Look with her eyes closed. She's got awakened mind 90. She's in the ICU. It goes to 91. She differentiates a little bit more. So her evolved mind circle goes down. Now she's in an active working meditation. But her gamma synchrony value goes eyes closed 90 to ICU 97, which is pretty phenomenal. <laughs> That's almost 100%. That may be the highest value I've ever seen for that. And so the purpose of showing you this is to say that this, she closes her eyes and she is super conscious and is anybody I've ever seen could possibly get while she's in the ICU and doing the work that she does, which I'm sure you would agree is why we're hearing such expanded perspectives from her during this program. And you'll find the same ones in her book. This is her doing the reball. It's pretty much the exact same pattern, except for the silly amplitude difference. And then she goes into imagining the orbs. And at first she went into the experience of depression that she had before the orbs appeared. 
But here, look at the difference in the gamma when she merges with the orbs. Then we have this big left brain gamma increase, and there's a very subtle change in her alpha delta brain waves. So you see this bottom band of delta here that even then, much more she has splayed delta in other situations, especially, of course, the reball, because then she is connecting with space-time outside of herself and her awareness of herself in space-time. But toward the end of the orb, she starts to retract that bottom band of delta. She's merging with the orb. She gets this huge left brain gamma increase. And she goes from, she's had, we can't count this evolved mind because that's due to the lack of alpha compared to the eyes open beta gamma here. But she's had in the others, 40%. Evolved mind 34, 44, and now she's going up 57, 74. So she is actually moving toward the circular pattern of the unity consciousness she reported as being what was she experiencing, which was to merge with these orbs. And then in the last segment, it's pretty much the same pattern is the one with the orbs. And so I asked her afterwards, what was happening there? And she said she felt like that was pure consciousness. She wanted to be inside the orbs to surrender. And she was seeing a color palette, a colored palette, a pattern of the nebula and green and violet and yellow. And at some point she decided to stay or come back to earth. So at that point, when she told me that, I went, wait, was she having an NDE herself there or starting to cross that veil? Uh, she can answer more about that in a moment. But the main thing is, these are extraordinary, super conscious scores that you rarely, if ever, see. And then the last slide I have is just to show you where this gamma increase started to happen. We can look at all this data in the world in these composite displays and these summary windows and so forth. But where we really uh, see interesting things is when we go to the mind mirror itself, which is what I'm going to do right now. Here, at the time where she was merging with the orbs, a right brain, 100 hertz, evolved mind pattern that is the pattern of universal consciousness. All right. Let's see. Now I'm going to, there we go. Make a switch over to the mind app. And I suppose that you will let me know if you see it. So many can wave their hands so I'll know that you can see. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, so here we are when she's merging with orbs, and we'll just put this into play. So what we're looking at now, you're seeing a huge amplitude change in the left brain and the top half of an evolved mind pattern, so close to 100 hertz evolved mind of universal consciousness. There it is again, a flare on the right. Just stunning patterns. I was sitting there watching her thinking, well, where did she go? What in the world is she experiencing for these patterns? And those were those orbs, the feeling of indescribable love that she felt in her bedroom that night. And yes, I'm sure that for a lot of people, these experiences can be traumatizing. But in Lauren's case, she was able to remember what the orbs felt like, which in our, oh, look at that one. That was almost 100%. Let's go back there. Which in our, yeah, look at that. That's so close to being the universal consciousness pattern that it's just silly. Uh, it's just so perfect. And of course, this is what brainwave training is all about, is to or people have a subjective experience that we can match with the brainwave pattern, and therefore you can re-access that state of consciousness by reliving it. 
So this is what Lauren's doing right here. Uh, this is the point here at 1643 where she said that this is where she saw the nebula and wanted to be inside the orb, started the surrender, all right in here. And you can really see this top half, very balanced, evolved mind at the top. This big rounding in the right here, and then alternating with the rounding in the left. Just absolutely gorgeous patterns. In fact, her amplitude is increasing so much that I'm going to have to back off so you can see the whole pattern, zoom out. So what you're looking at, for those of you who may not be from the mind in your community, uh, is a brain that's united with itself united with, in her case, the orbs, and united with the energy within them. So there's no difference between the subject, Lauren herself, and those orbs. This is the two are uniting as one and into oneness. Interestingly, that circular pattern is an O <laughs> for oneness. <laughs> And it's not something that very many people can describe. And I think probably people having NDEs are the ones having the hardest time of describing it because they're having such saturated experiences of it. Donna said, like she was the only being in existence besides that source because you've merged with it. And because it is, you are it. And just fantastical patterns. And really what they're telling us here is that anybody can go back into an extraordinary experience and re-experience it and have a profound, at least, I don't want to say a shadow of it, but a, an experience of it that to, to some degree, a great degree for Lauren, but for everybody else, to some degree matches the original experience. And I suppose, Lauren, that's you must be teaching something similar to that in the classes that you tell us about what you were teaching them at row the NDE spectrum, where they experience and embody through guided meditations the transformative event aspects of it without dying. So how do you, what yeah. were you teaching them there? So it, it's interesting to see this, Judith. I actually, I, I think you gave me some printouts, but to this day, I still am not sure what I'm looking at. So I appreciate your authority, you and trans translating that for me. Thank you. It's really interesting to to, I, my memory of that experience was merging with the orbs and just trying to recall that that memory of what it felt like for me and how uplifting it was and reassuring it was. And I think the mind mirror and similar tools, EEGs, that sort of thing, are the tools to help validate for you your own personal experience. You don't necessarily need them, but we like them. They're reassuring. To, to have that validation that what we're experiencing is real. But in my journey with trying to explore consciousness experiences, which has just become part of my life path, for some people it is sudden, like an NDE or an OBE, and that's a gift. It can also be disturbing, as Donna pointed out. There, there can be elements of it that are disturbing, but for most of us, it is a slow burn and being consistent with the practice over time. And my, my experience of spiritual transformative experiences has been exactly that, since I, my commitment to a practice of meditating through sound technology, which for my monkey mind has been the best, honestly. My experiences are subtle and unfolding, but they're no less important and no less transformative. They've literally, if I look back over time, they've changed me, changed my family, changed just by the very nature of showing up as a transformed being. It changes the people that I interact with. And that's the gift that we bring to the world from these experiences. To, to have an OBE 
or an NDE in and of itself is really not that important. What's important is how it changes us and in changing us, how we change the people around us. And that really is the premise of uh, the program at the Monroe Institute is it's exploring and validating that any of the experiences that we have that are beyond our five physical senses on that, that spectrum has the potential to be a spiritual transformative experience. In some of the writing questions, somebody inquired about gamma, which is really interesting. And I, I'm not a neuroscientist, so I, I'm not really sure what transforms or what happens to us when we're exposed to gamma, but I know it's pretty juicy. And we have my, my co-facilitator, Fred Reibel, who leads the ND, who's the head trainer for the NDE Spectrum program. We were taking some of the exercises using Monroe Sound Science. And he said, what would happen if we applied gamma? So we have two side-by-side -side experiences of those meditations using sound science. And it's pretty profound that the gamma does give some extra propulsion to your experience. And I don't understand it, but I have no problem saying that it helped. But I think the, our, our goal with this program was to demystify the experience, that it's not an elitist experience, that people do have some really profound experiences that are stunning and are far reaching as far as the the edges of the universe and unity consciousness, even the far reaches of a room that you're in. But it doesn't have to be the what we have experienced from the participants in the NDE spectrum is that kind of redefining transformative experiences invites in some experience past things that have happened to the participants to say that was a spiritual transformative experience. And I think sometimes when we try to divide humans into categories of experiences, like I had an NDE, maybe I had an NDE, sorry, I didn't have an NDE. When we try to subdivide like that, it's, that is, that's not in service to all of us moving forward and getting the most out of transformative experiences we do have. And people have had, in our program and myself, we've had dreams that have a certain quality that offer us incredible uh, transformative pivotal opportunities. And to be able to expand consciousness to a spectrum of experiences, including the awakened state while doing the mind mirror, it opens you up to a lot that can really leave you uh, in awe of, of what's possible. Yeah. And I think it helps just to blaze the trail. A lot of people come to the Monroe Institute who don't meditate, who have very stressful lives, and they, as you said, have some experience that said, wait, is there something else? And then with the support of the sound science, which is very focusing, helps the brain to balance. And if they have this a strong enough intention, then something may happen. And as you say, it may not be all the bells and whistles. It may not be a five alarm fire, but it's something that's opening a pathway, that's opening a portal. And that translates into daily life. So that then we end up becoming more open and receptive and better able to have these experiences in and out of meditation. So I think that's, that's so true. Yeah. And I think most of us, Judith, who are having a human experience, we are following a thread and we hold on to that thread and we never let go of it. Yeah. You know, thread is leading us. And sometimes it's a subtle thread, but if we are able to focus onto that and hold on to it, it can lead us to extraordinary places. And there, I, I talk about the Monroe Institute because that's been my experience, but I have a lot of friends and explore, explorative communities who have never been to the Monroe Institute, but have you know, dedicated themselves to mindfulness practice or walking meditations or connecting with spirit through art. There are so many ways. I think the invitation is to find the way, the method, but not just the method, the community that fosters and supports your journey. 
And for me, that that has been the Monroe Institute, where I've just formed deep spiritual friendships and found a thread that resonates with me and that I can keep track of. I can keep track of that thread that I'm following. Before we started, I, I said that, yeah, that we had met, that Laura and I met at Monroe Institute. And I said, you find a lot of unlimited minds there. In fact, you would say that they're all pretty unlimited because they're there in the first place because they be believe, sense, or hope to come to believe uh, that we are more than the physical body. <laughs> so there's step one right there. Yeah, but I, I, I've met and I have friends who have been on shamanic journeys or friends who have been on mindfulness journeys or even more cerebral journeys who have arrived at the same place. I think it's just finding what method you resonate with, what what train rails are the slickest for you that <laughs> propel you forward I love with that. joy and resonance. Because before Monroe Institute, there were meditative and spiritual exploits of all kinds, and there will be others that extend to the future that we can't even imagine. So I think it's right. just in your community and your that and your resonance. Okay, before we turn to people's questions, I just want to ask you, has there been, or can you search your memory right now to think of any maybe NDE experience that someone had that was particularly meaningful to you? Just touched your heart kind of thing. Yeah, I actually, one that really comes to mind was in, in COVID. And no matter what you do or do not believe about COVID, in that situation, no matter what caused it, the lungs don't work. Mm -hmm. And and those were the people who were in our ICU clinging to life with lungs that were scarred and very thick and fibrous. And what the survival rate in people who made it to our ICU was very slim. And I remember one person in particular who was in our ICU for eight weeks and we were turning him on his belly, turning him on his back, on his belly, on his back. And whenever we finally, when he started that slow uptrend toward survival and we were able to get him off the ventilator and when he got his voice strength, he was just so excited to tell us un, unbidden what had happened to him. And he had, speak of, speaking of spectrum of experiences, he had a lot of different experiences in that eight weeks where he had out-of-body experiences, he had near-death experiences. There was never a time where we coded him, where we pumped up and down on his chest because his heart stopped. There was never anything like that. And because we often have to use paralytics in the, something to paralyze every muscle in the body when people are having that much trouble getting oxygen where it needs to go, we have people on continuous brainwave monitoring. So they're on continuous EEGs so that we can make sure that we have them in the right level of sedation so that we're not being unkind and that we think they're not moving and that they're unconscious, but just to make sure that level of paralysis matches deep sedation. So we had, we were monitoring his EEG all the time that he was having these experiences and he was able to float around the unit, tell us things that were outside of his room. He was able to float up near the ceiling and tell us what he observed. He was able to go out of his body over those eight weeks at will Enough to the point that he said he got bored. This is not very interesting. Is this all there is? And he said he, as soon as he thought, is this all there is, there was this moment where he was catapulted into another space. So just that question, just bringing that question. And to us, it looked like nothing was happening. To it, it, we just, it looked like normal brain waves of some, I actually think this was one of the right end questions. This looked like normal brain waves of someone who is deeply sedated. And so there was never a point in time where it looked like he had flat brain waves or that during a deep state of meditation, they were doing you know, deep de delta theta undulations. There was nothing like that. So that was so curious to me. But he also, when he asked that question of, is this all there is? He remembered that moment where he was propelled out of his body into a deep, space of, of infinity and able to connect with loved ones, beings that he couldn't describe and 
there was some overlay of his belief system where he saw his mansion being built on streets of gold. But that, based on the moments when he would float in and out of awareness, even awareness of what we were saying, recalling some of the conversations, it it just re reinforced for me and my team that you cannot judge by the physical signs that you are seeing what is going on deeply inside of someone's consciousness. Mm -hmm. so he was having this rich experience over time and everything all by all of our physical monitoring, everything looked pretty much the same. I wonder if the paralytics cause the thinking mind to quiet down. I actually I would say it would be the opposite because if you are on paralytics and are not appropriately sedated and you can't find your own rhythm to vital signs, to breathing, that sort of thing, to your heart rate, it can be terrifying. And so you tend to have a hyper level of alertness. Mm. So that's why we have them on the continuous EEG so that we can monitor and make sure that we have an appropriate level of sedation so that we feel comfortable that they are not aware. Okay. Of so he was sedated. Deeply. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, so do your brain waves? Do they show? I wish I, ha I wish I had a trace. <laughs> yeah, so, because that if you had a record of that, in fact, you're the only person who can collect the data that we would love to have and run through the mind mirror. Because there's no way, I, unless somebody dies while I'm got them hooked up, <laughs> that I'm going to be able to see what that looks like. But here you are, if you're running, and I'm sure you're not always running brain scans, but if you <laughs> are running them, could you just save that for us and see if we can somehow? <laughs> it depends. There are HIPAA restrictions, protected patient information. So it depends. And they are... We don't need their name. We just <laughs> want to see if they're going to flatline or almost flatline, or if they're going to have a hugely splayed delta, or if they're going to have a hugely splayed delta followed immediately by a blast of gamma, and then blast off somewhere, and then they come back in their body, and there's another blast of gamma, big splay of delta, and then, hello. That would be quite an undertaking to, to be able to untangle that and correlate the timing of their experience with what we were seeing on EEG, not impossible, certainly, but it, yeah, it is. Something to think about. Yeah, something I, know to think about. I know you said you don't feel like you have the need to verify, but, mm -hmm. and we don't have a need to verify, but we certainly have a curiosity about oh, it. Sure. No, wouldn't yeah. we? Yeah, well, no, the curiosity well, is there. I, I suppose I said that to speaking to the, there is a body of research in the E world to whom that body, that data is very important. And that I just want to be clear in saying that I am not a researcher. I, I don't mm -hmm. uh, apply you know, rigorous standards to try to determine what was happening when someone reported an experience. I, and, and that is, that's simply where my curiosity lies. I am eminently interested in how these experiences transform people's lives. And proving that they do or do not exist is just really, has not been something that's important to me. But I understand that it's important to to some people. And that's how we gain information and, and draw conclusions. Yeah. I prefer that you just keep those people alive and let somebody else do, <laughs> do the research. All right. Shall we open up to questions? How about you guys? There's a lot of people here with us today. We, of course, welcome you all. So happy that you are here. And to ask a question, all you, Oksana, maybe I should ask you how you want to handle this. Do you want people to raise a hand? Then you called on hands. Any form, Judy, if I think people can just unmute and start and uh, somebody okay. else can raise the hand next and we'll manage. All right. Sounds like a plan. Please feel free to ask questions. There are only good questions. Beth already raised the hand, so let's uh, start with her. Hi, Lauren. Hi, Beth. Hi, Beth. Good to see you. 
Great to see you. My first question, I have two questions and a comment, was, was her session supported by sound support? And if it was there Gamma involved? I think that's for you, Judith. Oh, wait. Oh, do you mean the session of Lauren's that we looked at? Yes. Oh, no, she was no support whatsoever. <laughs> That's thank you, Beth. <laughs> That's why that was so profound, because there was nothing going on except a bunch of people sitting on the couch in the control room, me sitting there, the brainwaves and nobody's quiet. Of course, somebody is going to have to sniff or move in their chair. And she just whoop, went into this these spaces you know, that other people need, would have needed sound science and quiet headphones, isolation. And she just went straight there, which is why we say unlimited mind, because clearly she's in that same mind. When she's in the ICU, this is her brain. This is, she's always here. So for Lauren, it was, to put the words of, put in the words of Rocky Horror, it was just a jump to the left <laughs> to hop into one of those orbs. And then it was just a jump to the right <laughs> to hop into it and emerge with the orb. And it was just nothing. She just did it. And just to paint the picture for you as to what was going on in that room, there was a lot of noise. There were people who were talking. There were a lot of side conversations. And before you jump to the conclusion that I'm all that special because I'm not, I was so exhausted. I remember just feeling profoundly tired. And what I was thinking of was I had a level of engagement of kind of diffused curiosity, but I was really tired. And I think by the time I sat down in the chair and was hooked up, there was a part of me that was just happy just to sit down. <laughs> and, and I do remember that. And sometimes though, isn't that the truth? Is that when we had, when we disengage from our our physical connection with what's going on around us, it's easier to access those spaces. And I think that was an important part of that moment too, is that I was just really, I was a bit weary and that made it easier just to follow. I remember hearing Judith's voice, almost like somebody who was being hypnotized. And I remember hearing the, the racket going on around me and people laughing and chatting and Judith was in a corner of the room doing her experiments and it became very orienting for me to just focus on Judith's voice and what she was telling me and that is something I do remember about that experience to whatever extent the background noise of people talking became its own sound science coupled with the hum of people talking that vibration coupled with me being in a state of just really being ready to go offline, I think that helped, honestly. A lot of people would like to go offline like you. A lot of people like to be in the ICU with those brainwaves or anywhere else. Yeah. Okay. And what was your second have, question? I have alpha waves when I'm taking care of people. <laughs> That's <Ada>. good. <laughs> Just with well, Lauren, I'm very interested in gamma, and those are some of the most incredible numbers that I have seen. So just FYI. The second question is, I've noticed whenever I talk to people and they've been intuitive their whole life, I ask them, have, did you have any trauma around your birth? And a lot of people have near-death experiences at birth, problems breathing or, or something like that. Uh, my question to you is, I know, I'm not sure if you work with a lot of children, but have you seen where you've seen those near-death experiences and then seen children later and interviewed their, I guess, the results of that near-death experience? And have you found that to be true with you as well? I That's so curious. I, I don't work with children. I treat 18 and above. So I am an adult critical care specialist. But I that is a question I carry with me because I've had intuitive moments and I had an, an intense prolonged febrile illness whenever I was an infant. And it's it's remained with me as a curiosity, did that impact any intuitive moments that I have? Did that kind of lower the threshold for me to have them? And then I think about my oldest daughter who had a bit of a traumatic birth, and she is much more intuitive than the rest of us and has some mediumship type abilities. So I, that is a question I carry. Do those traumatic moments, even in your death experience where you come back from a 
severe trauma or an oxic brain, something that kind of rattles uh, the connection of physical facility to this earth? Do, do things get loosened up and make you a little bit more open? I think maybe. Okay, great. And then my last thing that I want to say is I've heard you present before and you inspired me to whenever I'm in my healthcare role and work with patients to ask them whenever they've come from surgery or anything traumatic, just, hey, did you have any experience or dreamlike questions? And it's amazing how that has opened the door. And it it's not that they're they're already in rehab usually by the time I see them or outpatient. And it's amazing how much relieved they are to be able to talk to somebody who one believes them and will listen to them. And it's just, you can see a change over them. So I appreciate your knowledge and, and expertise and um, finesse whenever it comes to talking with patients about that. So thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Yes, I am so happy to hear you say that because I, I, my, I think our most important tool is just to ask the question and make it safe for people to answer. And I think I've had the criticism offered to me that it seems like I have an inordinate amount of cases. I'm like, when you look at the, how long I've been asking the question, it actually fits the national statistic or international statistic of reported NDEs per year, like 1%, 2%. And I ask the question, so I hear. And I'm so glad to hear you say, Beth, that in asking the question, you hear people's experiences because I think they're out there. Anybody else? Don't be shy. I see somebody raising their hand. I, it says iPhone, so I don't see a name. Red shirt. Can we unmute you? Green jacket. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah, I'd like to be able to unmute one sec. I can't find Richard. So if you wave or somehow show me. It's, yeah, she's waving. She's got a red shirt and green jacket. Uh, she's, okay. You oh, you have to unmute yourself. I'm clicking us to unmute. I can't do it for you. Yeah. Oh, have you muted? Yes, I can. Oh, yes. Hello, Judith. Hope your arm's a lot better. I met you in the Monroe Institute in Virginia in October at the My Mirror. Okay. Um, Lauren, are you well? Yes. Good. Okay. When you mentioned about that feeling of that orb that you felt like you were encapsulated in, when you felt that energy, did it feel very warm, contented, and serene? Absolutely. I didn't want to leave. It yeah, now that feeling the there is like you're saying with orbs generally are actually consciousness in my eyes of people who've passed away. And obviously they're reaching higher frequencies, like you say, Gamma, and then probably maybe in what's still the lambda, where it's just at a higher frequency. Mm -hmm. And then obviously when they go back into that delta state, when you have got the comparison of the both frequencies in unison, and you felt that overwhelming feeling mm -hmm. of, I don't want to, I don't, I just want to stay here. When you go to sleep at night and we all fall, close our eyes and we all fall off and drift off to sleep, we come out of our bodies automatically, but we, we're not consciously aware of that. Whereas you was consciously aware of that feeling of coming possibly out of your body and being encapsulated in that energy. At that point there, did you think to yourself, this is what death is? Need not. I don't know that I had in that moment, I don't know that I even registered that much thought about it. My thought was that this feels so much better than what I've been feeling. And I I just found it overwhelmingly loving, uh, but I did not make that connection consciously of this is what death feels like. I thought this is what love feels like. Yeah, so you felt very healed. So mm -hmm. if, if you felt that feeling consciously, people who then go to sleep at night literally must leave their physical cells and heal others, but not consciously aware of it. That's what I'm sensing. Sure. Yeah, it's certainly so interesting to think about because I, I've thought about that moment a lot. 
Lovely. It's just a wonderful, like you say, experience when you get that total and utter encapsulation of somebody else's etheric self on a conscious level than yeah. what you actually do when you actually are asleep. Because obviously you accept it more when you're asleep because you have no control. So when you are awake, there'd be a lot of element there with lots of people would be fear. Oh my gosh, what is happening to me? What is that? What, what am I feeling? What am I supposed to be feeling? Whereas you actually embraced it and allowed it to happen, but naturally. I think my defenses were so low based on how I was emotionally at the time. I really didn't have enough to mount to fight. So it was easy to surrender and it was a transformative experience for sure. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I can add just a tiny comment on that from my own perspective. And it was that at age 22, 24, I had a mystical experience of exploding into light when I was on the way to a doctor's office and thought I was going to receive some really bad news and I'd ask for help. And uh, when those waves of light started to warm my body and explode inside me, now I know it's a kundalini arousal. Then I had no idea of anything. My first thought was, oh, this is what it feels like to die. And I was crying and just filled with this incredible love. And that was my first thought. This is what it feels like to die. Oh, take me. <laughs> was quite ready to go. You actually <laughs> had that feeling. You had that feeling of this is what it's like to die when you were having it. Yeah, I was quite sure of it. And there was a download of information that followed it that had to do with about death and dying. Yeah. Cause, and, but, I, but I think it was situational too, because I thought I was going to go get bad news from a doctor. <laughs> and instead, I get to the doctor and he said, ah, that tumor's gone. Must be the medicine I gave you over the weekend. And I went, <laughs> nope, <laughs> that was not your medicine. <laughs> Something just happened. But I haven't obviously had any fear of dying since then for that reason. Cause I, and I will add that just like you with the orbs, when I meditate with the mind mirror on my head, and I even vaguely approximate that memory, it's an evolved mind pattern and it starts triggering some gamma. So, yeah, any mystical experience, as you say, it doesn't have to be an NDE or an OB. It can be anything that we feel, honestly, in these however many years since 2005, I've been doing this mind mirror work and hooked up literally thousands of people. It doesn't even require a name, a label. All it requires is a feeling of love doesn't matter who you are or where you are. If you can feel love, your brainwaves start to change a whole lot. And that's the most transformative thing we can do in the end is to connect with that feeling, that sensation of love and being loved and giving love with others. It's all the same thing. And I think, too, that one, one thing that has been true for me and the people in my immediate environment is having a practice and sticking with it. it whether it's a, a mindfulness practice, a breathwork practice, a sound science practice, something that is consistently putting you in that space, you are more likely to have experiences and to understand that most experiences are subtle and to adopt an attitude of not questioning them, but just accepting them as they come your way. I, I think that's the majority. Of, of people on a path are the, the slow, subtle unfoldings of something spectacular. And I, I think when you gather with people of like mind and that energy is amplified, it's more likely to happen. I know that when I'm with people of like mind, I'm more likely to have a spiritually transformative experience than when I'm by myself. And I, I don't, I think that is for a lot of reasons. You have people who bear witness, and that's so important to us. And as humans, to have people bear witness to our lives and our experiences, but also the combined energy is additive. Absolutely. So anybody else have any questions? We have about 10 minutes left. Speak now. Hola. 
Can you unmute yourself, Paula? There you go. I have a question for you, Judy. I always come back to, you mentioned you asked for help. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I, I just can't get it out of my head that the more I experience in life and the more I work with the population and even myself, that is very, that becomes very important to ask for help. Absolutely. I started doing meditative writing in 1987 when my life was in an absolute pit and I didn't know how to ask for help. And I was interviewing a priest who was, of all things, the light and sound director for a theater. Now, that's not a metaphor. And he said, just ask from your heart. And I went home and I said, all right, please help me. I need some help. And soon I started hearing an inner voice. And it's that way for everybody because you're, you're literally, whatever, I was talking about that funnel earlier. You just raised the bottom part of that funnel. Now more can flow in. Yeah, and every time you say, oh, gee, that was a funnel, and I felt that. And could that happen again? Ah, the funnel widens a little bit more, and love is the driver, ultimately. Of course, as Lauren said, people have to have enough focused awareness and sustained attention to be able to hear and feel and receive, but it absolutely, Paula, thank you for saying that. It absolutely starts with a very clear, I don't want to say cry or plea, but intention's not strong enough. It really has to be driven by desire, need, need. How are you doing? We have to talk, Paula. You've been working with a really, doing neurofeedback with a really stressed population. You, you must come back and tell us some more. Do another program with us. Fascinating. I thank Matt. All right. Thank you. Anybody else? Can I ask Paula what she does to? So know? interestingly enough, a little over 40 years ago, I started out my nursing career as an ICU nurse in a shop trauma mm -hmm. unit, tertiary care center, sister. Um, <laughs> but now I'm doing, I'm certified in biofeedback and neurofeedback, and I'm working in a men's residential treatment facility for addiction. One thing just here, that's, thank you for what you do, Paula. Clearly, even without knowing what you do, you, you speak with love and authority too, about your belief in, in, in what you're doing, his ability to change lives. But I think, you know, the importance of the mind mirror and biofeedback and all of these feedback systems is it is humans, we do value validation and it can reinforce an experience and can provide the launch pad for more experiences. So that feedback is really so valuable. It, is it necessary? No. Is it helpful? Yes. Absolutely. Amen. Did you have a question, Adrienne? Yes, I did. I wanted to ask about the Alpha Bridge. And so before I go to bed, I think about expanding my alpha bridge so that I can recall things. And certainly when I was in your class at the Monroe Institute last year, be having that small alpha bridge that you showed me and then it was me and Candace and Britton and some other people and we came up with and I, because I said, oh, it's small like pterodactyl arms. I said my alpha bridge was like a pterodactyl arms. So we tried to come up with an idea that I could resonate with to make it grow. And Candace said, how about, no, Tyrannosaurus Rex. That's the one that has the little arms. 
And so she said, how about the wings of a pterodactyl? And I was like, no. And then I thought about it and I thought of Guardians of the Galaxy, Groot. And so I meditated on my alpha bridge growing like Groot grows his, his limbs, his tree limbs. And I just, I guess there's a concern. The brain is always coming up with what if, yeah, but, yeah, but. And it was like, yeah, but you haven't taken that class. Can it shrink back? <laughs> I've been trying to, before I go to bed, just think about my alpha bridge continuously extending so that I can recall my dreams and my meditations. And I'm getting snippets more than I had been, but I didn't know if you had any other suggestions or thoughts about that. Yeah, and not probably just me. Others may have suggestions. One thing... Of course, of course, the moment you close your eyes to go to bed at night, you're going to be producing your alpha. But if you want to really exercise it during the day, you can best do that by enhancing your sensory perceptions, your awareness, deliberately taking time. We can all be caught up in our busy daily lives and doing many other things and completely zooming past Zooming through time, past one room and another, one building and another, without any comprehension of what's happening in our sensory world because of the speed. So that's up in beta. But there's a totally different way to perceive. And I must say, a whole lot of people all over the United States are doing it through microdosing. <laughs> and, and, of course, that quiets beta, but it does that, and you don't need to microdose to do it. It does that by deliberately slowing the brain so that suddenly you notice the fact that the light coming from the side is lighting up your computer keys. And then you look at that and go, oh, look, that's a pattern. And then, oh, look at all the beautiful colors in Adrian's house. Oh, I just love the way that, you know, see what I'm saying? So you just zoom into sensory perception. That's what triggers alpha. Okay. When you walk in, in a forest, the same thing is going to happen. There's another thing that triggers on alpha, and that is the same sort of shift, shift from single one-pointed awareness, I'm rushing through my life, to... Uh, imagining many points on a field. So instead of seeing one dot, several dots, and more dots, and then the next thing you know, you're looking at the field as you would a sky out of a sunrise or a sunset, that's an automatic alpha trigger, becoming aware of the space around you. You can even do it by becoming aware of the volume of space inside you, anything that connects you to the concept of space. Okay. Yeah. And so if you practice it during the day, then I would suspect that it's going to make you more relaxed in life, which should lead to a, 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 a more meditative dream life with those bells and whistles, rock and roll, full color, lucid dreams, ultimately. Okay. And when you said microdosing, you're talking about psilocybin? Yeah. And I've heard of so many people doing that now. It's astonishing. I haven't tried one. Somebody gave me a gummy. I, was, uh, I have a friend who's had a couple of strokes, so I'm driving her around a lot, and she was doing it. And I said, okay, I'm assuming I can drive. She said, oh, it's, you won't even notice the difference. And I really didn't. I noticed some, that some cars were shiny on the way into the restaurant and stuff like that. But um. It definitely shifted me more toward my sensory perceptions, and that's the whole key to it for everybody. But you don't need a drug to do that. You just slow down enough to throw your mind onto the color, shapes, forms, textures. Yeah. Thank you. Good to see you. 
Judith, uh, Judith mate, do you mind if I say a few words? Just to say that in the past, people used to do much more physical work. So we were more in our bodies just by the circumstances of life, right? Right now, we hardly remember about the body because we stay mental. So it's just bent overload, fast speed with all the media screens and obviously simple advice, get more often into your body. And that's why surprisingly or not, in what the world, most of insights come where? In the bathroom or toilet room where you finally connect with your body. And I just wanted to say a few words to Lorenzo, our main guest and speaker of today. But first of all, thank you to both of you, Judith and Lorraine, for coming together to do this program. It, it's precious because it's always great to see, I call it XXXL size consciousness people, not the body, but it's impressive and it's inspiring. And from my experience, when I was learning neurofeedback, just connecting with the traumatized people, war veterans, working with these patients, uh, we developed the same brainwave patterns of trauma. So I must say that I had an assumption just uh, for Lorreen because she has this sincere, deep interest uh, in these experiences, OB and D. And that keeps her focused on other people's experiences. And each time you connect, you find this path. They develop this neural pathways to these higher realms. And each time you connect and ask a question, you help them to integrate the experience and you dive in with them to, okay, show me the way once again. How was it? Where was it? And that's how we learn through each other by resonance, by tuning in and shamanic way, magic way. I don't know, but it's just the way. And then it would be my comment. My second comment would be especially good for those who learn to deal with the mind mirror or want to better understand the brain waves, because we talk about this extrasensory experience that lasts and sometimes even stays. So I should say when we go into OB or NDA, it's definitely no issue. We are slowing down, right? From our busy mind, it's just leveled down and down. And even if we end up with the highest gamma brain waves, just fastest, we still go there through slowing down first. It mm -hmm. feels like when they, um, people have this, keep this experience, it's they slow down and maybe speed up with gamma in the end, but they stay conscious throughout this experience. We slow down each time naturally go into sleep, right? <laughs> We slow down naturally when we meditate properly, but this kind of formula for me would be it's slowing down, but staying conscious and going also beyond identity of what we know beyond our beliefs. And of course, and so as mentioned many times, uh, it, it may become an issue if you are not prepared to open this door from your side, because beliefs play a huge role there so when you ask for help you, okay i'm opening the door i'm reaching the hand out so that's the story and i think it's always slowing down and going on that levels gives you this depth and give you this connection and builds the neural pathways so if you are willing you keep going there so that's the summary and the formula from the brainwaves perspective of what might be happening on a very basic level. <laughs> uh, thank you once again. And I thought Bruce wanted to ask a question as well. I'm sorry. I, I was worried I would run out of time. Judith, I think you guys actually answered this question quickly. You were talking about the amplitude and I wish I had some time to show you guys, because what I wanted to ask you about is how much is typical amplitude raising when somebody goes into you guys were talking about looking at a column, like when somebody goes into brain dead and there's like a near death experience and then they're actually dying, if you will. And you were talking about the call, which is like the out of body mind mirror read, reading that we get. It's very skinny, but what's the average uh, amplitude? Cause I'm working with a channel and she's, I'm on the other end of a lot of what I hear tonight a little bit. And that is that um, I'm working with people that they're there. They, that's where we're at. This is not a question. And in one of the meditations that we did for my case study, she said, I was Quan Yin. 
And I know for a doubt, I, I know beyond all doubt that I don't even question it. Like that's just, that's who she was because when she channels things in the meditation that we did before that, she said, I went to Arcturia and I was just saying, I wish I could share screens with you guys right now and show you where you, what you said, Judith was exactly right. Like the call appeared. And then there was that little blip down there where there was some Delta down at the bottom. And then in, in the, the one meditation, you could see it starting up on the top where you could see it like this. So there was like the lines on my, uh, it was incredible. And I was just fascinating, like, isn't it? It was incredible. And that's why I say with, with Dr. Bellig and, and just being here talking to you guys, I was like, wow, what is, cause the amplitudes that I was seeing in my display, one of them's over a hundred. I was just looking at it like good grief. What is the average? Because it goes gradually from nine to like 22, 23. And then within a couple, like it's within a couple of seconds too, because I remember in one of our classes, you were like, I think first we just hit at 1030. There was this one that I did with you. And you're like, I think this is this one pattern. And that's the only time I've ever seen it. And please forgive it's the excitement, you guys. It just gets my blood going talking about this with you. But, <laughs> but it, I, I just was like, holy cow, like their amplitude would just went shooting through the roof or hers did in particular when it got so thin, like it was unreal. Like the first time I saw it happen, I actually had to stop drawing for a second because I just couldn't wrap my mind around it. I hadn't seen the amplitude get so high. So is, is that like normal when it gets so like. It can, okay. I wouldn't, it's like Lauren was saying, everything, each experience people have that she's mapped and all of the experiences that we're mapping in brainwaves, they're all different. It just depends on what part of the brain everybody, a, a person wants to use to get somewhere. Because the truth is that all brainwave frequencies, all brainwave categories have their own portal to higher dimensions, if you want to call them, higher or more expanded dimensions of consciousness, and then we'll involve the others. <laughs> but that is a common one, to have a huge alpha delta blast out the bottom that then stirs up gamma up at the top. And I love to see that in the composite display because you'll just see that you see that delta just increasing. And then here comes the gamma right behind it. <laughs> They're just crossing over each other. But, oh, but, it, but it is in the end difficult, different for everybody. And I'm so happy that you're so excited about it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank we'll you. make a wonderful practitioner. <laughs> I can't wait. I can't wait to show this to you. It's really exciting. Uh, we're getting goodbyes from people who are saying thank you for a wonderful presentation and information, Lauren. Uh, is there anything you'd like to close with, Lauren? No, I just, just one final thought. I liked what Oksana said about just getting back into a more physical place instead of an electronic place. And I think about the old deer paths and buffalo paths that exist in nature. They're laid down over millennia that they don't even have to think about what path they're following. It, it may have once been just a depression in vegetation, but now it's become well-worn. And we create those paths every time we go into those spaces. And where I think the mind mirror and similar tools are so valuable is we can connect our experience cohesively with what we're seeing to just remind ourselves it's true. What we're experiencing is real. And those paths we're laying down the more we travel them, it'll make it more easier for us to go to those spaces. Beautiful, beautiful. I suspect that other people have other questions, but maybe they'll, if you, if it's a really burning question, you can forward it to Oksana or me, and maybe we'll get Lauren interested in some sort of email or other yeah. response. Thank you all for being here for this wonderful program. And Dr. Lauren Belg, thanks you so much for your time. I know that your time is not readily available, that you're so busy. I appreciate your being here with us and sharing experiences that have inspired you and thus now have inspired us. Thank you. Thank you. Come back when you do that new book or anytime and tell us more. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.